you knew Robert Parrish was going to be here, didn't you? You're not here to see me. Welcome to the 60 Days of Summer. How are you today? I can tell. I see a lot of green out there which means you're just as excited as I am. My name's Kyle Belanger. I'm a professor of communications at Springfield College, the place where the game was invented. And my guest today is one of the people who perfected the game that was invented at Springfield College. The 60 days of summer are 60 consecutive days of family-friendly entertainment right here at the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, underneath the watchful eyes of the Hall of Famers above me, all included with the price of admission. Now, some days, that means you get to come and learn to play hoop from the UMass basketball team. Other days, that means you can come for some entertainment, a dribbling exhibition, some fantastic court jester action. Other days, you get to meet some of the stars of today. And then there's days like today, where you get to meet an all-time legend. So for the next 20 minutes, I have the fun. It's just me. I mean, I'm glad you're watching, but I get to talk with Robert Parrish. After that, three of you will get a chance to ask Mr. Parrish a question. So all the youngsters out there who want my job, now's your chance, right? So be thinking about things you want to ask a Hall of Famer, a four-time NBA champion. And when that's all done, the fun keeps rolling. Mr. Parrish is going to head over to that table right there on my right and your left, where he's going to sign one autograph for each and every one of you. How's that for a plan? That's pretty good. Yeah. So let's get to it. I would like to introduce to you a member of the 2003 Hoop Hall class, a four-time NBA champion, a nine-time NBA All-Star, a member of the NBA's 50th anniversary all-time team. His number, double zero, is retired by the Celtics. His 21 seasons in the NBA is tied for the most ever. He played for Golden State, Boston, Charlotte, and Chicago. You know him as the Chief. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Robert Parrish. Thank you for the introduction, man. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Parrish, welcome back to Springfield. How are you today? Doing good. Thanks for having me. It's so great. It's it's so great to have you here for a bunch of reasons. One is that I get to look at your face all the time when I come to work. I can't see you. You can't see. You. <laughs> so let me ask you this. I want to finish. I want to start the way I normally finish which is to say, I, wa I want to talk about this moment right here. Because as you walked in today, there was an awful lot of Celtic green. There were an awful lot of double zero jerseys. There were an awful lot of 33 jerseys. There were an awful, I mean, this moment with you up there in front of all these people with all you've accomplished, can you put this into perspective for me? The ultimate compliment. That means I was a pretty good player, first of all. And second of all, all of you out there still remember not only myself, but my other teammates. So thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come out and spend a few moments with us. Thank you. And I want to, on behalf of all of my best friends who are sitting there and there and there, I want to thank you for taking some time as well. This is really meaningful. It's a pleasure. So I'd like to start, I'd like to start in Shreveport, Louisiana, if you don't mind. Let's go all the way back. And the one thing that I love, many things that I love about our game, is I contend that this game of basketball follows the American experience it, 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 for, in terms of inclusion, pre-civil rights, post-civil rights, uh, women's rights. I mean, this is, this is the game that evolves with our country. So your story starts in the 50s and 60s in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I have to believe that in those pre-civil rights days, we, you were already starting to find basketball and sports as a way to become the man that we would all learn to and just know and love. Can you talk to us about how your upbringing started to shape you as a man? Well, I, first of all, I have to give credit to my parents. 
Um, my parents' philosophy uh, was to never shun anyone, never look down on anyone. And I think that's one reason why as my notoriety and celebrity grew, I always try, try to stay balanced, try to stay humble, try to never shun anyone. I know sometimes I come across as being distant and aloof, but that has nothing to do with the people that are around me. So one thing I always said about basketball to me is like music. It transcends race, religion, political beliefs. It's all inclusive. And that's one thing I always would be appreciative about basketball because it allowed me to interact with other races, other religions, yeah. other political belief, you know, it, it just look beyond skin color. It's all about the, the content of your character. And that's one thing I like about sports. It's all inclusive, male or female. Yeah. And that's one of the positives about sports, no matter what the sport is. Absolutely. And as I have to say, as a father and a multiracial family, to know that inclusion in these 90 some odd feet and the 10 feet, to know that it all takes place right here. And it, it is, it doesn't matter which of my sons you are, you can play, you're welcome here. Yeah, exactly. So legend has it, Mr. Parrish, basketball sort of found you <laughs> because at 6'6 in seventh grade, <laughs> it's hard to walk by the basketball coach in your middle school, isn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and you may or may not believe this. I never liked basketball growing up. <laughs> we, we never played basketball growing up. We played football. We played baseball. We played a little tennis. We didn't play basketball. And so my junior high school coach uh, approached me one day and told me that I was six foot six for a reason. <laughs> and I told him, yes, my father was six foot three. So <laughs> that's the reason. You know, I had a smart re response to that, but he, he, he never, never let me turn my back on basketball. He kept telling me there's a reason why you are uh, that tall. And so he saw something to me that I've said this many times that I didn't see in myself because when I first started playing basketball, trust me, I should not have been on the basketball court. <laughs> I couldn't catch it, I couldn't hold it, I couldn't dribble it. All I was just a tall person running them down the floor. So he instilled this unshakable, unflinching confidence in myself, which have served me really, really well throughout my basketball career because as you know, no matter what you do in life, you're not always gonna get positive reinforcement from whatever you're doing in life. And I think that that's when the unshakable confidence comes in, into play. You got to believe in yourself and your abilities when nobody else believes in, in you. And that's one of the things that I've always remember about my first college, I mean, my first basketball coach. That's fantastic. Now, your coll for college, you stay in Shreveport. You go to Centenary and have one of the great college careers of the era. 87 wins, 21 losses, and then it's time for draft night in 1976, where the Golden State Warriors, called Robert Parrish's name, eighth overall, in a draft loaded with Hall of Famers, Alex English, Adrian Dantley, Dennis Johnson, Robert Parrish. Mm. I, I love hearing draft night stories from the pre-ESPN, pre-Twitter days. Because it was very different than the drafts that many of the youngsters out here are used to seeing. True. Can you tell us about your draft experience? How did you find out the Golden State Warriors were the ones? What were you doing? All that stuff. S sitting around wondering, was <laughs> I going to get a phone call? I, I was in my college coach's office <laughs> and just wondering, uh, was I indeed going to get that call? And when I got the call from the Golden State Warriors telling me that they was going to draft me. I was going to be their first pick. That's when it hit home that my first coach knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's when it hit home. 
Yeah. Because I never in a million years thought, first of all, I ever would be playing basketball. And then I had the opportunity to play basketball for, for a living. Yeah. Never in my wildest dreams that I thought that that would have happened. And not to mention to play for as long as I played also. So I, I, I definitely have to give a lot of the credit for me being a basketball player and a successful one. Because I think one of the reasons why I was able to excel when, it, when there wasn't a lot of confidence and belief, belief in my ability this was because of what my first coach always told me, always believe in yourself. So when, it, when the naysayers and the critics and the second guessers was questioning my ability, that message always resonated in the back of my mind. When you get to Golden State, San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, and you walk into as a young, humble, as you still are, basketball player, and you walk into that locker room, and there are, there's Jamal Wilkes and Rick Barry. Mm -hmm. You want to about talk about two guys with gigantic personalities. Jamal Wilkes, Rick Barry. What did those early weeks feel like for you? Uh, there you were, you made it, you're, you're playing in the NBA, your name is on the back of the jersey. But how did that feel in the locker room for a young Robert Parrish? Odd. And not to mention, my, my first practice was humbling. Yeah? Yes. I went 0 for 13. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now, now you got you to picture this. I thought I was a bad man. I thought I was all of that. Until I started playing against players that was just as good as I was or better than I was. So it, for me, it was humbling. And not to mention my rookie year, when I, when I was just starting to get a little confidence in myself that I thought I'd be able to... Uh, stay in the NBA and belong in the NBA. We played against the Los Angeles Lakers, and this when Kareem was at his apex of his talent, his prime. He averaged 39 points, mm. 18 rebounds. Mm. So mm. I was like, uh, maybe I do <laughs> not belong in the NBA. <laughs> like maybe. <laughs> maybe I need maybe. to revisit. <laughs> That subject. So it was a humbling experience for me. And I really didn't feel like I belonged yeah. in the NBA until my first year here in Boston. And that was, so I want to talk, let's talk about June 9th, 1980. A year for Boston Celtic fans, a day for Boston Celtic fans, even the young ones. You want to talk about the most consequential day, pot potentially, in Boston Celtics history. June 9th, 1980, that is the day that you and the number three pick in that draft come to Boston in exchange for the number one overall pick. All the Boston Celtics did with that pick is draft Kevin McHale. So in one day, Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale become the first big three in NBA history. I've read in many places that that might have really helped to save your passion for professional basketball. That, that, that trip to Boston, you sort of hinted at it a bit, coming to Boston. Can you talk about the way that you received that news that you were being traded and, and whether or not there's any truth to that? Did that help to save you, you having fun in, in the NBA? Yes, it, it did. Uh, I was questioning whether I wanted to continue to play basketball and, what, and as I said before, whether I belong in the NBA. And, and we was, the Warriors, the Golden State Warriors and myself was there in the middle of negotiations for an extension on a five-year contract. And then I get a phone call saying I'm being traded. So that was a gut punch. Right. So anytime, in my opinion, when a team trades you, they either found something better or they don't want you anymore. Uh -huh. So that added to my right. trepidation about whether I wanted to continue to play basketball or whether I belong mm -hmm. in the NBA. And so after being traded to the, to the Boston Celtics, the trajectory of my career was altered forever. Mm -hmm. you know, not only my, my career, but uh, Larry, Kevin, you know, everybody's career went another direction, went up. And, and so, and, and you said, I want to correct, well, in my opinion, I want to correct you on one thing please, you said. Please do. The most consequential person yeah. in, in Celtics history. Red Arback. Yes, sir. In my opinion. Yes, sir. Because without his vision, without his foresight, 
all those banners would not be hanging yeah. from the ceiling. Mm. Think about that for a second. All the talent that he, he surveyed and watched and be able to get those guys to put their egos aside. Because you think about some of the egos that are hanging from the rafters yeah. in the Boston Garden. Yeah. Major egos. And for, for all of those guys, myself included, to put your ego on the side for the benefit of, of the team and the goals that the team and organization have set is a testament to Red Arbeck because Red Arbeck set the table for all those rafters, I mean, all those banners hanging from the rafters. Now you talk about, about feeling maybe not as welcome, not as wanted in Golden State and in like that, you're in Boston. So I want to talk about the welcome wagon in Boston. You talk about Red Auerbeck and the way that, I mean, legend of Red Auerbeck's welcoming personality, the cigar in his office and the open doors. How did that feel? Like when you arrive on day one, do you automatically feel like this is home? No. My first time I meet, I meet Red Auerbeck, first thing he did to me was thump ashes on my, on my pants leg. <laughs> <laughs> First thing he did, I was like, okay, so this is how it's going to be, huh? <laughs> but af after that, though, he, he, he welcomed me with open arms, and, and he, he told me uh, playing in Boston was going to be difficult in, in terms of mm -hmm. the media scrutiny. You know, don't pay attention to the outside noise. You know, you know what you can and can't do. Just go out and be the best player that you can be. And that was sound advice coming, from, coming from, from Red. Man, this is the part I was telling you. I only have three questions left for Mr. Robert Parrish. So if you have a question, we're going to select three of you. Start thinking about it now. I'll ask for volunteers after this question. My friends from the Hoopal staff will put you in a line to my right, your left. So be thinking now. Be thinking now. In Boston, you average a double-double over 14 years, uh, three titles in Boston, 81, 84, and 86. And, well, what I want to do is to go on a six-hour road trip with you and let you tell me stories about all of those teams. What I will ask you is this. How do each of those three titles separate themselves in your mind? Is one more special? Was one more rewarding? Was one easier? How do those three separate themselves for a man who's won four of them? Well, I would say the first one was the sweetest and the most challenging. Yeah. Because the most difficult thing in, in sports, no matter what level, is to win the whole chip, mm -hmm. to win a championship, to achieve excellence. So in, in, in my opinion, the first one was the sweetest because it was, it was so tough to get and we really didn't know what it took yeah. you know, to win a championship. So I, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Bill Fitch, our coach uh, of that 81 championship team because he had the same philosophy that my, my first coach had, my junior high school coach has, and, and that was the unflinching, the, the uh, unshakable confidence in, in ourselves because uh, in, in the Eastern Conference Finals back in, in the, during the 80-81 season, we were down in Philadelphia 3-1. And Coach Fitch never let us stop believing that we could turn that series around and we was able to come back and win that series and go on to the championship round because of Coach Fitch. And that's where it all started. Starts, in my opinion, is with the head coach. So the first one was the sweetest and the the third championship, the 86 championship team, was the toughest yeah. because I say that because we had so many big egos to manage yes. and, and, and satisfy. And to be able to put those egos uh, aside and to win a championship, I have to give a lot of credit not only to the, to the coach but also to Red because Red kept telling us that if we win it, everybody going to get their just dues, their rewards, you know, and, and uh, their uh, – Notoriety. Right. If we win it, everybody is patted on the back, and he kept preaching that message to us all season long. 
Man, that team. Just looking back at that roster, that team was filled with oh, characters. We were loaded. Yes. Oh my. And not to mention the egos, too. Right. Let's not forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question for Robert Parrish? Put your hands in the air right now, and three of four of you, maybe three of you, will be selected by my friends at the Hoopball staff. Your fourth title is remarkable to me. Because you want to talk about personalities and egos. Let's talk about guys like Jordan and Rodman and Pippen and Ku Coach. Because your fourth title comes in 97 with the Chicago Bulls, your final championship. That has to feel, after, all, after 20 years in the NBA, that has to feel like the ultimate accomplishment to be able to go out a champion. Can you talk to us about that last run and how, your, how you had to switch your role in order to achieve that one? Yeah, my role changed. Uh, I went from being a, a major contributor to a potential championship team to more of a mentor yeah. to the younger guys. And, and one thing I like about the, the Chicago Bulls organization, they mirrored the Celtics organization from this perspective. They was all about winning. Yeah. And they did the necessary uh, things that required to put the team in the best position to win the championship. They went in and got the, the necessary players, they got the right coach to, to make sure that they was in the best position to win a championship. And speaking of personalities, one of his most interesting personalities, Dennis Rodman. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> as, <laughs> as a follow-up, I just want to ask, because you are, you're like, you're, you're Robert Parrish. You show up in that room, you, you're a very steady, calm figure, and as a mentor to some of the younger guys, how do you handle that when one of those younger guys is Dennis Rodman? That's got to be an incredible job, or do you just let Dennis be Dennis and then worry about the other guys? That's the best way to roll with Dennis. <laughs> let Dennis be Dennis. <laughs> but the, but the, the, the other young players, uh, uh, Jason Caffey yeah. and Derek Dickey, they gravitated towards me because sure. they wanted to pick my, pick my brain about what it took to, to be a professional because it's more than just walking out on the basketball court to being a professional. You know, how you carry yourself, you got to be conscious of what you put in your body, who you hang out with. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be, especially, it wasn't so much back then because you didn't have social media going on, right. but uh, as opposed to today, you really got to be very careful who you associate yourself with because everybody got a camera now. Yeah. So any misstep is going to be on social media. So that's the one thing I, I try to instill in the young guys. Be careful who you hang out with, who you party with, who you lend your name to, uh, be, because it could come back to haunt you if those people got a, a negative agenda. Yeah. My final question for you before we get to the hard ones over here. My final question, Mr. Parrish. Your lifestyle is also absolutely legendary. Yoga, martial arts, vegetarianism. Is this something, when did, that's obviously not a mistake. You don't go 21 years in the NBA without being fully conscious, as you mentioned, of your intake and your lifestyle. When did all of those, when did, when did that realization, did you come into the NBA with, with, those, with those kind of decisions being made or did you realize early on? How did that happen? The, when I, my first year with the Golden State Warriors, they hired a nutritionist, uh -huh. and the nutritionist planted in, my, in not only my, my mind, but my teammates, about the importance and the benefits and the rewards of nutrition, hydration, yeah. the whole stretching. Because back then, mo most of the, uh, at least the pro basketball players, you played your way into shape. Right. You know, you came to training camp, and that's when you got into shape in the training camp. So they laid the foundation for do your groundwork before you get it to training camp because it's less wear and tear. And also, you're able to sustain what you build on if you put in something good in your body. Right. You know, after a strenuous two-hour workout, and then you go out and have a cheeseburger, I liken it to having a, a, a tough workout and then go smoke a cigarette. Right, right, you right. You just defeated all that hard work sure. and, and all that good that you just did for your body. So I learned early on the importance of, of nutrition, uh, hydration, uh, stretching. I think one of the reasons why my career lasted as long as it did was because of the yoga 
in the martial arts. Because I never forget this. We was playing, we was on that Texas swing and we was in Dallas. And I hit a wet spot and I did a, a, a split. And it went from <laughs> under me. And, and had I not had the flexibility, oh, yeah. the, the team doctor from both teams told me my career would have been over. Wow. Because I would have torn all of my groin area, would have severed everything. Talk about consequences right oh, there. That's that, because things could have been real ugly there for a minute. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Parrish. Thank you. 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 So now the fun continues. I've got looks like three or four people over here get the lucky chance to ask Hall of Famer Robert Parrish a question. I'll bring the first person up right now. I have two requests. Yeah, you're, you, you got a fan section too. One is that um, you introduce yourself to Mr. Parrish, tell him your name and where you're from, and then allow me to hold the microphone while you ask. All right, buddy? All right, always be prepared. I like this. All right. Hi, my name is, hi, my name is Josiel, and my question is, who inspired you to play basketball? <laughs> my inspiration came, as I, as I alluded to earlier, my junior high school coach. He inspired me, he motivated me to play the game of basketball. Thank you, Josiel. Good question, by the way. <laughs> All right, come on up. We'll take the next, next question. This man looks determined. What's your name? Where are you from, buddy? Um, my name is Bryce Baker, and I'm from Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Um, my question is, what drills would you recommend a middle schooler to do to get in the NBA? A good question, by the way. I, I'm, I'm all about uh, the basic fundamentals, dribble, pass, shoot. So work on, on, on those particular skills. Uh, and also work on your right hand and left handed. Right handed. Work on your off hand. Okay. It's very important, if, especially a basketball player, be ambidextrous. What I mean by that, use both hands. So as, as much as you work on that right hand, Work on, work on your left hand equally as much, especially the dribbling part. Yeah. Work, work on that left hand. Okay. That, and, and that will be the foundation because as you get older, if, if you are one of the lucky ones to be a, a pro athlete, once your athletic skills start, start to diminish, that's when your fundamentals are even more important. You gotta be able to dribble past shoot when you can't run, jump, as high as you used to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excellent question, Bryce. <laughs> hey, buddy. All right, what is your name? Where are you from? I'm Cameron Elwer, and I'm from Delphos, Ohio. Hey, what's your question? Who was your favorite player to play with or play against? I don't have any. Uh, I take that back. <laughs> uh, I have to say my, my uh, favorite uh, teammate was, was Dennis Johnson. And my reason for him being my favorite uh, teammate was because he kept peace in the locker room. Whenever someone was disgruntled, had a grievance to file, DJ always made sure that that grievance was addressed and it was smoothed out. So he was the common force in our locker room. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you. And we always save the hardest question for last, so bring it on. How are you today? Can you tell Mr. Parrish your name and where you're from? My name is Valencia, and I'm from Holyoke, Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, before you were in a basketball team, what was your dream job? <laughs> Great question, by the way. I, I always have said that uh, were I not an athlete, I, 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 have a, I have a degree in education. And so I would have gone back to school and got my doctorate, and I would have been working with the young people in some capacity. What comp capacity, I don't know, but I know I would have been working with the young people. Very good question, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valencia. Ladies and gentlemen, one last round of applause for Mr. Robert Parrish. Thank you. Thank all of you. That was so much fun. Oh, 
thank you. Like I said, you make it easy. Well, I appreciate it. Now, my friends at the hoop hall will put you in line. Now, the hall pass line is the one on the